Number three, the murder of George Sidney Mills. On November 2nd, 1952, 19-year-old Derek Bentley and 16-year-old Christopher Craig broke into a warehouse in London, England. A girl saw the young man climb up one of the warehouse's drain pipes and she told her parents. Her father called the police and Detective Constable Frederick Fairfax arrived a few minutes later. Fairfax was able to corner the young man on the roof and he told them to surrender. Craig was defiant and he refused to give up. Fairfax ran at the young man and he grabbed Bentley who was closest to him. Bentley managed to break free and then he apparently yelled, let him have it Chris. Chris then pulled out a gun and shot at Fairfax. The bullet grazed Fairfax's shoulder and he wasn't too badly injured. After shooting at the officer, Craig ran and hid. Fairfax was able to arrest Bentley and he put Bentley, who was handcuffed, into the back of his police car. As Bentley sat in the back of the police car, more officers arrived to help arrest Craig. 42-year-old police constable George Sidney Mills got the keys from the owner of the warehouse, so he made his way through the warehouse up to the roof. Once Miles walked out onto the roof, he was shot in the head and he was dead within minutes. Craig was arrested after he ran out of ammunition. Bentley was interviewed at the police station and he apparently confessed. This is an excerpt that is supposedly a verbatim transcription of what Bentley said. When we came to the place where you found me, Chris looked in the window. There was a little iron gate at the side. Chris then jumped over and I followed. Chris then climbed up the drain pipe to the roof and I followed. Up to then Chris had not said anything. We both got out onto the flat roof at the top. Then someone in a garden on the opposite side shone a torch up towards us. Chris said, it's a copper, hide behind here. We hid behind a shelter arrangement on the roof. We were there waiting for about 10 minutes. I did not know he was going to use the gun. A plain clothes man climbed up the drain pipe and onto the roof. The man said, I am a police officer. The place is surrounded. He caught hold of me as we walked away. Chris fired. There was nobody else there at the time. Craig, who was 16 at the time of the shooting, couldn't be sentenced to death because he was a minor. However, since Bentley was 19, he could be sentenced to death. The prosecutors argue that Bentley knew that Chris was carrying a gun because he said the gun instead of a gun in his confession. When Detective Constable Fairfax tried to arrest them, Bentley supposedly yelled, let him have it Chris, which the police took to mean that Craig should use his gun. Therefore, Bentley was the ringleader of the robbery, making him responsible for the death of Miles. He was found guilty, and he was sentenced to death. Meanwhile, Craig, who pulled the trigger, was sentenced to 10 years in prison. Bentley's death sentence was immediately unpopular, because while it seemed like a slam dunk case, there were actually several major problems with it. The first is that Bentley never touched the murder weapon and he was handcuffed in the back seat of a police car when Miles was killed. Secondly, Bentley had an IQ of 77, so even though he was 19, he had the mental capacity of an 11 year old, being that 16 year old Craig was more likely the ringleader in the robbery. Also, there was a problem with Bentley's supposed orders to shoot at Fairfax that demonstrated that he was the ringleader in the shooting. Bentley supposedly yelled, let him have it Chris. The defense argued that the sentence is ambiguous. The police understood it as Bentley ordering Craig to shoot. However, 
it could have also meant that Bentley was telling Craig to hand over his gun. Both Bentley and Craig denied the sentence was ever yelled. Bentley swore he didn't even know that Craig had a gun until he shot Detective Constable Fairfax. Despite the problems with the case, three police officers swore under oath that Bentley confessed and the confession was transcribed verbatim, so there was no way for Bentley to appeal his death sentence. Bentley swore he never confessed to knowing about the gun. The case was so controversial that 300 people gathered outside the House of Parliament to protest the execution on the day that Bentley was supposed to be executed. Their protest fell on deaf ears. On January 28, 1953, three months after the shooting, 19-year-old Derek Bentley was hanged. Christopher Craig, who pulled the trigger, served his 10 years and he has been a law-abiding citizen ever since. He has always told the same version of events as Bentley. He brought the gun to the robbery and Bentley didn't know about it. Bentley's parents relentlessly advocated for decades to have their son's name cleared. In 1993, 40 years after Bentley was hanged, he was given a royal pardon for his death sentence. However, he was still considered a murderer in the eyes of the law. In 1998, Bentley's case went back to court, and to prove that the confession was false, Bentley's parents had forensic linguistic professor Malcolm Coldhart analyze it. He noted several irregularities. The main problem was that the three police officers swore that the confession was what Bentley said verbatim. They claimed he said everything unprompted and they did not interject during his monologue. Coldhart found evidence that this wasn't true. In the confession, Coldhart found several examples of narrative justifications. An example of a narrative justification would be, let's say you were telling a story about retrieving your phone from your backyard and you encountered an aggressive raccoon. Would you say, I walked outside, no one else was there, I picked up my phone, a raccoon ran at me, so I ran back inside. Or are you more likely to say, I walked outside, I picked up my phone, a raccoon ran at me, so I ran back inside. Mentioning that no one else was in the backyard is an example of narrative justification. When telling a story like that, most people would not mention that no one else was in the backyard because that is a foregone conclusion. The only reason someone would volunteer that information is if they were asked. When telling the story about the aggressive raccoon, you would only mention that no one else was in the backyard if someone listening to your story asked if someone else was in the backyard when you went outside. An example of a narrative justification in the confession is, Chris then climbed up the drain pipe to the roof and I followed. Up to then, Chris had not said anything. We both got out onto the flat roof at the top. In this case, the sentence, up to then, Chris had not said anything, is the narrative justification. Bentley would not have mentioned that Chris hadn't said anything unless an officer asked him something to the effect of, had Chris said anything. Another example is, the policeman caught hold of me, and as I walked away, Chris fired. There was no way else there at the time. The policeman and I then went around a corner by a door. Bentley wouldn't have said that no one else was there unless he was asked if someone else was there. Finally, there's the statement that was most damning at his trial. Bentley supposedly said, we hid behind a shelter arrangement on the roof. We were there waiting for about 10 minutes. I did not know he was going to use the gun. Bentley saying the gun instead of a gun convinced the original judge that Bentley knew about the gun going into the robbery. If he didn't know about the gun, he would have said, I did not know he was going to use a gun 
instead of, I did not know he was going to use the gun. But this is an example of narrative justification. Bentley saying, I did not know he was going to use the gun, is a response to the question, did you know that Christopher Craig was going to use the gun? That strongly suggests that the police asked Bentley questions and didn't record the questions in the transcript. Therefore, Bentley's statement that three police officers swore was transcribed verbatim was not in fact verbatim. Besides the narrative justifications, Coldheart also had a problem with the way that the word then was used in the confession. When people talk and use the word then, they usually use it at the beginning of a sentence. For example, most people would say, I went outside to get my phone. Then I saw a raccoon who ran at me, so I ran back inside. As opposed to saying, I went outside to get my phone. I then saw a raccoon who ran at me, so I ran inside. In Bentley's confession, then doesn't appear often at the beginning of a sentence. Instead, then is used after the subject of the sentence. For example, Bentley supposedly said, my mother told me that they had called, and I then ran out after them. He also supposedly said, Chris then jumped over, and I followed. Chris then climbed up the drain pipe to the roof, and I followed. The use of the word then after the subject is not common among people who speak English. In the court transcripts, Bentley does not do this once. The use of the word then after the subject is quite common in a specific type of writing, English police statements. This suggests that a police officer wrote at least parts of the confession instead of Bentley saying those words. Coulthard's testimony helped clear Derek Bentley's name. In 1998, Bentley was finally granted a posthumous pardon 45 years after he was hanged. His case was one of the first examples of forensic linguistics being used in a criminal case, but it wouldn't be the last. Number 2. The Murder of Jenny Nickel In June of 2005, Jenny Nickel was 19 years old and she was living with her family in Richmond, North Yorkshire, England. She worked at a grocery store and she played guitar in a local band. On June 30th, Nickel collected some of her belongings and stuffed them into her rucksack. She told her parents that she was going camping and that she wasn't going to come home that night. On July 4th, her parents still had not heard from her and they became worried. They found her car parked in the parking lot of a nearby pub. They decided that it would be best to file a missing persons report. On July 8th, the police interviewed 45-year-old David Hodgson, an unemployed husband and father of two. David said that he had never met Nicole and he had no idea where she was. The police were certain that he was lying. Nicole had attended high school with David's two daughters. There were rumors that Nicole and David had been in a sexual relationship since Nicole was 14 years old. The rumor first emerged when Nicole was in high school and led to a group of girls at the school harassing her and one girl even physically assaulted her. The rumors also resulted in David moving out of his family's home for a brief time. The day after the police interviewed David, two text messages were sent from Nicole's phone. The phone was 65 miles north of Nicole's home when they were sent and they were sent to two of her friends. The first text to her friend, also named Jen, reads, Hi Jen, tell Jack I am okay. Know everyone's going to be mad. Tell them I am sorry. Living in Scotland with my boyfriend. <laughs> Myself, dad's going to kill me. Mom doesn't give a <laughs> Hope Nick didn't grasp me up. Keeping phone of Tell dad car jumps out of gear. Installs, put it back in auction. Tell him I am sorry. 
The second text message, sent to a different friend, reads, Thought you were grassing me up. Might be in trouble with me dad. Told mom I was leaving. Didn't give a <laughs> Been to Kessa camping. Was great. Have to go. See ya. Then, five days later, her father received a text message from her phone. This message was sent when the phone was over 400 miles away in Jedburg, Scotland, and it reads, Why do you hate me? I know mom does. Told her I was going. I ain't coming back, and the pigs won't find me. I am happy living up here. Everyone hates being rich. Only mate I got is Jack. Text you a couple weeks. Tell pigs I'm nearly 20. Ain't coming back. They can off. She got me in this. Her fault, not mine. Get blamed for everything. I am sorry, okay? Just had to leave. She's a No food in, and always searching me room, eating me sweets. Had to go, okay? I am very sorry. The text messages prompted searches of the area where the phone was when they were sent, but no trace of Jenny Nichol was found. The police continued to interview David Hodgson, and he admitted that he did have a sexual relationship with Nicole. He said it started when she was 16, and they only had sex five times. In July, David was arrested for perverting justice, and he was released shortly afterwards. Three days later, David attempted suicide, but survived. After the three text messages, Nicole's phone stopped sending out text messages. The police thought that they weren't written by Nicole. The most logical explanation for the text messages was that Nicole had been killed and her killer wrote the text messages to throw off the police by making it look like she was still alive and chose to disappear. In November, the police upgraded the case to a murder investigation. They had forensic linguistic professor, Malcolm Coulthard, who helped exonerate Derek Bentley, look at the text messages. He compared the three text messages that were sent after Nicole disappeared to 11 text messages that were written by her and 100 text messages that were written by David, along with two suicide notes that he wrote. Coldheart found that the person who wrote the text messages misspelled the word off. They left out the second F. The writer of the text messages also spelled the word might, M-I-T-E, instead of M-I-G-H-T. Also, instead of writing myself, the author of the text wrote me-self. Finally, the person writing the text spelled their contractions, like ain't and didn't, without apostrophes. Nicole didn't make those errors when she wrote but those same errors appeared in the samples written by David Hodgson. The police also found out that on the day the text messages were sent, David had hired a car and the trips were long enough to get him to the areas where the text messages were sent. The police also discovered that David and his older brother Robert had constructed makeshift cabins in the moors. In one of the cabins, the police found Nichols' DNA along with a CD player and a teddy bear that belonged to her. The police learned that in the weeks leading up to her disappearance, Nichols had developed a relationship with David's older brother, Robert. Robert was unaware that David and Nichols had a relationship. In May 2007, nearly two years after Jenny Nichols disappeared, both David and Robert were arrested. Robert was eventually released and cleared, and David was charged with her murder. David denied killing her. The police didn't have any evidence that David killed Nicole, like the murder weapon. In fact, at the time of this video, her body has yet to be found. What the police do know is that David became very jealous whenever he saw Nicole talking to another man. The police think that on the night that Nicole disappeared, she went to spend the night with David in his makeshift cabin. 
During the night, David found out about her relationship with his brother, and he snapped. He probably killed her on the night that she was last seen, or early the next morning. He disposed of her body somewhere, possibly in the moors. When he realized that the police were on to him, he hired a car to drive him to the areas where he sent the text messages to make it look like Nickel was still alive. A jury found David Hodgson guilty of murder, and he was sentenced to serve a minimum of 18 years in prison. He has always maintained his innocence. Jenny Nichols' parents are hoping that he'll admit to what he did and reveal the location of their daughter's remains. Number 1. The Murders of the Colemans On November 14, 2008, Joyce Myers Ministries, based out of Fenton, Missouri, received a disturbing email. The writer said that televangelist Joyce Myers should stop preaching. Then, instead of threatening Myers or her family, the writer threatened to kill the family of Myers' chief bodyguard, Chris Coleman. This email was the first in a series of emails that threatened Chris and his family, which consisted of his wife Sherry and his two young sons, Garrett and Gavin, and they lived in Columbus, Illinois. About two months later, on January 9, 2009, Chris went to the police in Columbus. He told them that his family found a threatening letter in their mailbox. Four months later, on April 27th, Chris went to the police about another threatening letter. Neither letters had postmarks on them, meaning they were hand delivered. Both letters told Chris's wife, Sherry, to stop her religious work or she'd experience her worst nightmare. A week later, just before 7 a.m. on March 5, 2009, Chris called a neighbor, who was a police officer. Chris said he had just been at the gym and he was heading home. He tried calling Sherry at home, but no one was answering the phone. The neighbor, who was aware of the threats against the family, called for backup and a uniformed officer arrived minutes later. They looked around the outside of the house, and in the back, they found an open window with the screen cut out. They crawled through the window, and they could smell the distinct scent of spray paint. When they got into the kitchen, they saw the message, I am always watching, spray painted on one of the walls. As they walked towards the stairs, they found more messages scrawled in red spray paint. Several of the vulgar messages started with the F word, and then there were words like punished, and messages like, you have paid, spray painted on the walls and the stairs. Upstairs, they found the bodies of 31-year-old Sherry, 11-year-old Garrett, and 9-year-old Gavin. They were all in their beds. They had been strangled to death, most likely with some type of wire. 11-year-old Garrett had a bedsheet covering his body. The killer had spray painted you on the bedsheet. The killer tried to write something on the bedsheet that covered Gavin, but he ran out of spray paint. About five minutes after the police arrived, Chris returned home. Another officer who arrived on the scene just before Chris had him wait outside. Chris was then informed that his family was dead, and he started sobbing in the driveway. The police brought Chris in for questioning, and they thought his behavior was odd. Notably, he didn't ask how his family died, and he didn't ask to see their bodies. Later that same day, a woman named Tara Lynn got in touch with the police. She was a high school friend of Sherry's. She said that she had been having an affair with Chris since November 2008, around the time that Joyce Myers Ministries got the first threatening email. She told them that the family was killed on the same day that Chris said that he planned to file for divorce. The police concluded that Chris started to plan his family's murder six months earlier when he started having the affair. 
The reason he killed them instead of divorcing Sherry is because Joyce Myers didn't want any of her bodyguards to be divorced. If he got divorced, he would lose his six-figure yearly salary and he would have to pay Sherry for child support. He sent the threatening messages himself and spray painted the walls to make it look like the murders were committed by people with a vendetta against Joyce Myers Ministries. While Chris had motive to kill his family, there wasn't much evidence tying him to the murders. The murder weapon was never found, and Chris's DNA wasn't found in any incriminating places. What they did know was that the threatening emails were sent from Chris's laptop but they couldn't prove that his laptop had been hacked, meaning there was no evidence that Chris wrote the emails. This raised the possibility of reasonable doubt. The district attorney then asked Robert Leonard, a professor of forensic linguistics, to compare emails that Chris had written to the graffiti found at the crime scene and the threatening letters and emails. Leonard worked with FBI forensic linguists James Fitzgerald, who was instrumental in the arrest of Ted Kaczynski, the Unabomber. Leonard and Fitzgerald developed the Communicated Threat Assessment Database. The Communicated Threat Assessment Database has more than 4,000 criminally-oriented communications containing more than a million words. With the database, they can identify certain patterns in written threats. They discovered that the writing in the threatening letters and emails and the graffiti were very similar and most likely written by the same person, meaning the person who wrote the threatening emails and letters is most likely the killer. The first similarity they found between the threats and the graffiti was the F word. It was the first word in many of the spray painted sentences and many of the sentences in the emails and letters start off with that word as well. Swear words and threatening letters are common, but according to the Communicated Threat Assessment Database, it's very rare for sentences to start off with the F word in threatening letters. That word usually appears later in the sentence. The graffiti and the threatening emails and letters were also similar to the way that Chris wrote. In the emails, letters, and the graffiti, the killer spelled U using the letter U instead of writing out the word U. Native English speakers commonly spell U that way in text messages, but it's not common for people to spell it that way in emails and letters. Chris often used the letter U instead of writing out the word in all forms of written communication. Secondly, the killer put the apostrophes in the wrong place in contractions like dozen and can't. The killer put the apostrophes after the T's instead of before them and in one case there was a space between the apostrophe and the last letter in the word. In his emails, Chris also put apostrophes in the wrong place when he wrote contractions. He also put them at the end of the word instead of before the T. Leonard concluded that Chris most likely wrote the emails, letters, and graffiti, meaning he was the one who killed his family. The amount of circumstantial evidence, including Dr. Leonard's testimony about forensic linguistics, was enough to convince a jury that Chris Coleman was guilty of killing his entire family. He was spared the death penalty, and he was given three life sentences. Thank you so much for watching today's video. If you liked it, please subscribe for more videos just like it. Please don't forget to visit criminallylisted.com where you can suggest cases and buy merchandise. Please also check out our Patreon page where you can get access to an exclusive podcast. But that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.